Well, good morning, church family and friends. Thanks for joining in. This is now week two of us recording um, our singing and, and preaching for you, and we hope that uh, you've had a good week. We hope that you've stayed encouraged um, as we're in this uniquely strange time where we are unable to meet together. And I don't know about you, but uh, the, it's only been two weeks, but it seems like it's been eternity since we've actually gathered together as a church. And, and I continue to look forward to the day where we get to meet together again. Not sure when that's going to be yet, but I'm so thankful that we can use technology such as this to communicate together. You may have been wondering in this time um, some hard questions, things like, where is God in all this? Why would God ever allow something like this to happen? Uh, perhaps some of those questions have, have run through your mind. Uh, it's only natural sometimes for those things to come into our minds. And w the fact is, we don't, we don't know all of what God's doing in this time. Uh, he, he is doing countless things um, with multiple purposes we know in this time. But one thing we do know is from Romans 8 this morning. And I want to bring that to an encouragement to you this morning. Romans 8 28 says this, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called and those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Romans 8, 28 tells us one thing we know for sure right now is that God is working all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Many people know that verse, but not as many people have thought through the logic of what it actually says. It says we know that he's working together for good for those whom he has foreknown and those whom he has predestined, those whom he's called and justified and will glorified, he will work together all things for their good. He will work all things together so that we are becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. And just think about the logic of if you are in Christ today as a child of God, he has said he has foreknown you from before time began. He has predestined you. He has called you he has justified you, and he will ultimately glorify you. If God has promised all of that for you as a believer, will he not work all things together for good right now? Let that be an encouragement to your soul this morning. Let that be the truth that you know throughout this week. In the midst of all the chaos and all the unanswered questions, we know God is working together for good because he's proven a track record that he's worked for us from the beginning of time. Well, we hope as you enjoy some singing this morning and hearing God's word preached that you will be encouraged. Thanks for joining in. We look forward to seeing you soon. A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failing Our helper he amid the flood Of mortal ills prevailing For still our ancient foe Does seek to work us woe His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate On earth is not his equal Did we in our own strength confide Our striving would be losing We're not the right man on our side of God's own choosing You ask who that may be Christ Jesus it is He the Lord of hosts His name 
from age to age the same And he must win the battle And though this world with devils filled Should threaten to undo us we will not fear for God has willed His truth to triumph through us The Prince of Darkness grim We tremble not for Him His rage we can endure For lo, His doom is sure one little word shall fill him. Abide with me. Father, it's our prayer that as your word is preached, that your spirit will move. Lord, I pray that you would work in this time, that you would incline our hearts to worship you, incline our hearts to desire your word. Lord, even as we're meeting in homes right now, I pray that you would lessen all distractions open our eyes to see wonderful truth from your word. Lord, peel back the scales on our eyes, the, the tiredness and the worn out from a hard week, a stressful week perhaps for many. Lord, I pray that you would peel that back so that we can see your glory as it's revealed in Scripture. 
Lord, unite our hearts and our minds together so that in this time, this is not just an exercise of watching someone preach or a preacher speaking words, Lord, but if you would be so gracious and kind to unite our hearts and minds together, we would worship you based upon the truth that we're developing in our minds and it's taking root in our hearts. And Lord, ultimately, God, I pray that you would satisfy our every longing that we have in you. Lord, we are so thankful that in the midst of chaotic times, in the midst of trials and tribulations and things that bring us concern, Lord, we are thankful that you are the sure and steady anchor of our soul. So as we open your word now, I pray that your spirit would come and move and work and transform us in more and more into the image of Christ. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, please turn in your copy of God's holy and perfect word to Daniel chapter 10. We are, we are continuing our series through the book of Daniel this morning. If you were watching last week, uh, we appreciate you tuning in. And uh, if you were expecting the passages in Daniel to get easier now that we've passed the 70 weeks passage last week, uh, I hate to be the one to tell you that we are not out of the woods yet. Uh, the last three chapters in Daniel is still quite dense. However, the approach this week will be much different than last week. If last week's sermon felt like we were crawling on our hands and knees together through the details, this week's sermon will surely feel like we are soaring in the clouds. Whereas last week, I, I looked at seven verses in particular down in detail into the very exact words of the verses. But this week, I will take more of a survey approach. And so today, we're actually going to be covering chapters 10 and 11 of Daniel. One commentator actually said of this text, particularly of chapter 11, he said, this text should be reserved for a classroom, not for a sermon. Well, here we go and let's see how it goes. So let's begin with chapter 10. One important piece of information to know about as we go into the last three chapters of this book is these last three chapters of the book are all dealing with one vision. So before in Daniel, when we've been dealing with visions, Daniel or others would receive a vision from God and each vision would be covered over the span of about one chapter. Well, it's important to know that the last three chapters of Daniel cover just one vision together. So the layout of the following three chapters of Daniel, the last three chapters goes as following. In chapter 10, a messenger comes to Daniel and he's going to give him a vision, <clears throat> but just a small portion of it. Chapter 11 is where we see that vision more in full. And then in chapter 12, we will see how God's promised end comes. But for now, let's begin with chapter 10. And in chapter 10, a pattern is developed. First, the messenger of God is going to come to Daniel, give him a small portion of a vision. But as he comes, we are going to see a two-cycled pattern begin. First, we see Daniel's reaction to the messenger. Second, we see the messenger's words to Daniel. And then third, we see God work. This cycle happens twice in chapter 10. This is what it looks like. The messenger comes to Daniel, Daniel reacts, the messenger speaks, and God works. And then Daniel reacts, the messenger speaks, and then God works again. So notice in verse 1 through 6 of chapter 10, the messenger coming to Daniel. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar, and the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had an understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. 
On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed with linen, with a belt of fine gold from Upaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude." So this is how the chapter opens in Daniel chapter 10. Daniel is practicing good spiritual disciplines. He's fasting. He's probably praying. And all of a sudden, he sees this heavenly being clothed in linen, belt of gold, eyes of flaming torches. Now, some people actually think that this is a pre-incarnate second person of the Trinity showing up to Daniel in the moment. And I'm not completely sure. I actually lean away from that translate or this, that interpretation. Ultimately, the text doesn't tell us who this person is. But what we do know is this person, this is a messenger from God. It's a heavenly being. Now, notice Daniel's reaction to this messenger in verse 7. This is where our pattern starts, Daniel's reaction. Look at verse 7 through 9 with me. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. So the messenger comes and immediately what happens? Fear, trembling. The others, if you notice, the others who are around Daniel, they flee. Daniel loses all his strength in his body. His, his knees are trembling. He is losing color in his face. He is going ghostly white. And for a moment, he is frozen in terror because of this heavenly being And he hears the messenger's voice and he passes out. Now comes comes the second part of the pattern. Daniel reacts and secondly, the messenger speaks. Look at verse 10 through 12. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the last day that you set your heart, from from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humble yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The first thing the messenger says to Daniel is, Daniel, You are greatly loved. Now notice Daniel, he's still trembling. He's still in fear, but the messenger has given him enough strength to stand up again. And then the messenger says in verse 12, fear not. He commends Daniel for his humility. He commends him for being a man that has set his heart on God. He tells Daniel that because of this, Your prayers have been heard, and I have come to you. You are loved, Daniel. Your faithfulness has been seen. Your prayers have been heard. I have come to your help. That is encouraging. I cannot help but to take a model from Daniel here. That if we want our prayers heard, and if we want them to be effective, that we would not just be a people who pray every now and then, but that we would be a people that has our hearts set on God. There are options galore as to what you could have your heart set on. May we not be a people who pray only when we have a need, but may we always be a people who feels the need to pray at all times. May we be a people who humbles ourselves before God like Daniel. 
Do you realize that prayerlessness demonstrates pridefulness? You and I don't pray because we think we have things under control. And then when we do pray, it's often because we realize that we don't. In our prayer, we demonstrate our dependence on God. And when we depend upon our God, we are humbling ourselves and we are setting our hearts on Him. This is what the messenger commends Daniel for. You are loved. Your faithfulness has been seen. Your prayers have been heard. Your heart is set on God. And now comes the third part of the pattern. God works. Look at verse 13 and 14. The prince of the kingdom of Persia, this is the messenger still speaking, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision is for days yet to come. And this one's a little harder to see, a little harder to understand. What we see in, chat, in verses 13 and 14 here is genuine spiritual warfare. You need to know that there is a world, there is a realm that is active and taking place all around us that is unseen to our physical human eyes. The world that you see on earth is not the only world that's at play in this world. What the messenger says in verse 13 and 14 is that the angelic forces of God were in a battle with the demonic forces of evil. The messenger says in verse 13, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days, but Michael, another angel of God, came to help me. In other words, the forces of darkness were resisting the forces of God, all of which was being unseen to the human eye over the province of Persia. But for a moment, the messenger has left the war. He has left the spiritual battle. He has come to Daniel to give him a vision of what will happen in the future. So, the messenger comes, Daniel reacts with fear, the messenger speaks encouragement, and then God shows his work. And now the cycle is going to start over in chapter 10. Once, we get, once again, we see Daniel's reaction to the messenger coming to him. Look at verse 15 through 17. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O oh my Lord, by reason of the visions, pains have come upon me and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me and no breath is left in me. Daniel loses strength again. He even asked in verse 17, how can I talk to you about visions if I have no strength within myself? Daniel is, he's wiped out from being in the presence of the messenger of God. So we see him lose strength again. And now the second part comes. The messenger will speak again, verses 18 to 19. And again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man, greatly loved. Fear not, peace be with you, be strong and of good courage. And he spoke to me, as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak for you have strengthened me. Once again, the messenger confirms God's love for Daniel. Tells him to be strong, he tells him to be at peace, tells him to be courageous. And once again, he gives Daniel strength. And now the final part of the pattern closes out chapter 10. Daniel reacts, the messenger speaks, and now we see God's work again, verse 20 and 21. Then he said, do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. 
And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come, but I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side except these, except Michael, your prince. The messenger, as we see, is going back to the spiritual battle over Persia. But he's taking a break to come encourage Daniel and to show him what the future would hold. This messenger and Michael, they're, they're fighting a, world, a war, but Daniel needs to know that soon the prince of Greece is coming, as the text says. Soon Persia will fall to the Greeks. That's how verse 20 ends. Behold, the prince of Greece will come. And that's the only part of the vision that we get in chapter 10. The prince of Greece will come. Now why would it take so long in this chapter to deliver that news. I mean, if you examine this chapter closely, this is not a chapter about delivering a vision. This chapter is consumed with how Daniel is reacting to this messenger from God. Consumed with this encouraging word from the messenger to Daniel. Consumed with the spiritual battle that's taking place between darkness and light. This chapter contains very little about the vision. And so the question that is running through my mind is, what are we to make of a chapter like this? Well, I have three encouragements for you from the pattern that we see presented in this chapter. First, consider the fact that considering Daniel's reaction to this heavenly being should push us to have a higher view of God than we do. Considering Daniel's reaction to this heavenly being should push us to have a higher view of God than we do. Two times we see Daniel's reaction to the messenger sent from God. And both times, what do we see? Fear, trembling, he loses strength in his body. It's very clear from the text that Daniel is quite aware of the fact that he is close to the presence of God. We would all do well to take whatever view we have of God and raise it. To adopt a higher view of him. This is the pattern of Scripture Anytime someone gets close to the presence of God, always there is a spirit of intensity being raised in the room. Never do we see anyone become more casual as they approach God and His presence more closely. Never. It's always higher intensity, falling on the ground, fear and trembling, no one struts up to God in his presence. And I'm afraid that our society as a whole has never been more casual to God than we are right now. Our culture is so confused on this subject. For many, casualness toward God is ignoring God. Seeing no relevance in him or seeing him only as an option among many. The reason so many see no need for a savior in Jesus Christ is because they see very little sin within themselves. And the reason so many see so little sin within themselves is because they see very little holiness in God. And the reason they see very little holiness in God is because in their mind, if he exists at all, he is just like them. But the Bible says he is not just like them. He is not just like me and he's not just like you. The Bible says that God is altogether holy, different, set apart, different than we are. And many people read the Bible and they say, I can't imagine a God that would be like that. And they say that because they can only imagine a God who is just like them. 
For many, God has just become a nostalgic tradition of their family. Heaven is a place that we make TV shows about. Hell is simply symbolic of all of our worst fears on earth. Jesus is a, is a buddy who is always there to boost my self-esteem. And the Spirit is just some force that helps me achieve my dreams. And the church is a place where I can go to feel good about myself. And the Bible is a security blanket for our weddings and our funerals. And maybe it's on our shelf in our homes if we need it for an emergency. But if we're honest, we would have no idea how to use it. There is no fear of God in our land. And there's no fear of God because we do not know Him. Not like the Bible describes Him. The only God we know as a society and a whole is the God that we create in our minds. And this is not the God of the Bible. Daniel's reaction of fear and trembling only makes sense when an all-sovereign, all-powerful, all-together different God is in the room. You do not fear and tremble when someone just like you, your best buddy, is in the room. No, when God is in the room, all-powerful, all-together different, we melt. The greatest need of our hearts, the greatest need of this church, the greatest need of this nation, and the greatest need of this world is to have a higher view of God than what we have right now. To see God as infinitely higher than ourselves. We desperately need to encounter and embrace the God of the Bible over the God of our imagination and the God of this culture and expectation. We desperately need to get out of our vocabulary phrases like, I can't imagine God would do that, or I don't know how I would feel about a God who's like that. We need to wipe those phrases out of our vocabulary because the nature of God is not dependent upon our imagination nor our feelings, but on what has been revealed in Scripture. The staircase that goes to the top of understanding God, His fullness, His beauty, His worth, that staircase has no top that we will ever reach. Church, we definitely need to raise our view of God infinitely higher than the one we have of Him now. Look at Daniel's reaction. God's presence enters the room and he faints. There is not a spirit of casualness, but a spirit of holiness. Altogether different. Woe is me, a man of unclean lips. So we need to raise our view of God. Second, hear the words of the messenger and be encouraged for God's love for you. Twice, Daniel is stripped of strength as he encounters this holy one. And twice, what is the messenger, what is the message the messenger gives? Oh, Daniel, you are greatly loved. You are greatly loved. Verse 11 and 19, the messenger strengthens Daniel with the truth that God loves him deeply. This is the unique characteristic of God compared to all the other false gods of the world. Other false gods may be lifted up. Other false gods may be considered holy and separate in the minds of their worshipers. But the God of the Bible, while being, yes, holy and separate and transcendent, the God of the Bible is also near. And he loves his children. This is Paul's point in Romans 8 where he says, what charge can come against God's elect? 
God has gone to great length to demonstrate his love toward his people. While he is holy and just, he is also loving and merciful. And the tension of that, being holy and just and loving and merciful, the tension is solved in the person of Jesus Christ. So he comes and takes the penalty for sinners, but not just to take their penalty, he comes to give them salvation. Listen, just because God is holy doesn't mean he's not approachable. Just because God is higher than our minds can fathom, just because we tremble before his presence doesn't mean that we can't come near. Just because he is altogether different doesn't mean that he doesn't adopt us as his children. This is the work Jesus has accomplished. In one man, in one act, he brings the holiness and justice of God to collide with the mercy and love of God. And this is the God of the Bible. Imagine the greatest king in all the world. Imagine the highest esteem that people give him as they should. Imagine all the responsibilities that this king would have. Imagine him being always busy, always in control, always calm, always collected. Imagine the king having everything on his plate he's having to manage. And even with all of his responsibilities, who does this great king allow to interrupt him? His grandchildren, right? He's still the same king, same responsibilities, same majesty, same royalty, but when his grandchildren run in the room, things stop. The majesty and royalty of the king does not change the nature that he is loving, tender, caring, kind for his children. (laughs) See the reaction of Daniel. See the high view of God and know that if you are in Christ, if you're one of his children, that he loves you with a love that you cannot imagine. As high as your view of God can be and that you can never grasp him in his fullness, neither could you grasp the fullness of his love for his children. Yes, God is high, holy, transcendent, but he is near, caring, and loving. Do not get that out of proportion. Only seeing God in his holiness and transcendentness will develop a God that is there, but one that we can't approach. Only seeing God that is loving and caring is only seeing a God who we can go to approach, but he never holds us accountable in truth. Seeing a God who is both is the God that has adopted us as his children. See the high view of God. Hear the words of love. And third, as you see the spiritual warfare of the angels, be confident in the work of God that your eyes cannot see. This messenger, remember, takes a break from the battle that he's involved with to come and speak to Daniel. He's involved in a world that Daniel cannot see. He's performing actions that Daniel knows nothing about. And this is the work of God. He's always working where you can't see. He's always working in ways you do not know. We don't always see the work like Daniel does here. But we can still trust that God is at work. This is chapter 10. See the high view of God. Embrace the loving encouragement. Be confident in his work. And then it goes to chapter 11, where we finally get into the details of the vision. At the end of chapter 10, the messenger tells Daniel that the prince of Greece is coming. Why would there be such a buildup before telling the vision? All of chapter 10, he only gives him one little piece. Why is there such a buildup? 
Well, I believe it's because the messenger knows that he's about to share some things with Daniel that's hard to hear. The people of God are going to go through hard times in years to come. And in order to receive that truth well, Daniel will need that high view of God. In order to receive the truth well, Daniel will need to remember God greatly loves him. In order to receive this vision well, he will need to know that no matter what happens, God is still working. So with that in mind, let's look at the vision he receives in chapter 11. Look at verse 1 through 4. And as for me, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. This is still the messenger speaking. Verse 2. And now I will show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia, and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up against all the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule with great dominion and do, do as he wills. And as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity nor according to the authority with which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others besides these. This is the messenger still talking in verse 4. He tells Daniel how Persia's rule will come to an end. Essentially, he says there's going to be four more kings come in Persia before the end. The last one, he says, is going to be extremely wealthy, but ultimately he will fall to a greater king that rises in Greece. This great king that rises to power that overtakes Persia is Alexander the Great in verse 3. We've studied him in previous chapters. But if you remember, after Alexander the Great died, the kingdom of Greece is split into four regions where four generals take over. Four different kings take over the regions of Greece. And this is what verse 4 means when it says, His kingdom shall be broken, Alexander the Great, and divided toward the four winds of heaven. Four regions ruled by four separate kings in Greece. Now starting in verse 5 and going through verse 19, the visions... The vision focuses on two of these four kings in Greece. One king to the north that rules over Syria. One king to the south that rules over Egypt. And it's within these verses, verses 5 through 19 of chapter 11, that we see many details of vision, of the vision of history happen. These verses, 5 through 19, are all about the battles that's taking place in the Greek Empire between the king of the north and the king of the south. And you can confirm these in history that has actually happened. When you see in these verses 5 through 19, when you see a reference to the king of the south, it's talking about all the line of kings in Greece that ruled over Egypt. When you see in these verses where it says the king of the north, it's talking about all the line of kings that ruled over Syria. These two territories battling against each other. Constantly a struggle of power. And this turmoil goes on for many years within the Greek empire until a significant change of power comes. And we see the change of power come in verse 20 and 21 of chapter 11. It says... Then shall arise in his place one who shall ascend an exactor of tribute for the glory of his kingdom. But within a few days he shall be broken, neither in anger nor in battle. In his place shall arise a contemptible person to whom royal majesty has not been given. He shall come in without warning and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. So years and years of the territory of Syria, territory of kingdom in the Greek empire, battling it out. Years and years pass, and then one king comes, and he overtakes things, as verse 21 says. And this king is talking about is Antiochus Epiphanes, whom we also have studied in our previous chapters of Daniel. Now, verses, the second half of chapter 11, verses 22 to 45, tell of all the horrendous actions that Antiochus Epiphanes did while ruling. If you remember, he was especially a brutal ruler over the people of God. 
Verse 24 says, he shall do what his fathers nor shall his forefathers have done. Verse 36 says, he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God. Verse 37, he shall pay no attention to the gods of his father. Verse 40, among others says, he shall come into the glorious land, making reference to how he will persecute God's people. Daniel sees this vision in chapter 11 and the terror of this king that would bring the, the northern territory fighting against the southern ter territory, king after king after king taking over each other. And this would be great concern for Daniel because if you look at a map, you have Syria to the north, you have Egypt to the south, and what is found right in the middle? Jerusalem. Jerusalem the people of God. Right in the middle of Syria and Egypt, battling it out, constantly fighting is the people of God. We see these kingdoms just trampling over the Holy Land and then trampling back over them again for years and years and years. And God's people would feel the brunt of these forces. This is what Daniel sees in this vision. Attack, attack, trample, trample, king, king, persecution, but sprinkled in this vision, there's a few glimpses of hope. In chapter 11, that's a sea of dark persecution and troubled times for the people of God. In the midst of that dark sea, Daniel sees a couple of lighthouses. And it's these couple of verses that the people of God will need to hold on to in the midst of these dark hours to come. The first lighthouse we see is in verse 32. It says, he shall seduce with flattery, talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, he shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. The people of God standing firm and taking action just fit in there just, just briefly in the midst of this dark forest, the people of God standing firm. And then the second glimpse of hope, the very last phrase of the chapter in verse 45 is describing the horrendous actions of Antiochus and it says, yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. Here we have two chapters worth of vision that looks extremely bleak for the people of God. Two chapters full of nations battling nations and betrayals and alliances and death and persecution and blasphemy against God and evil rulers and desecration of God's holy land. Years and years worth. And where do we find the people of God caught right in the middle of it. These two verses, verse 32, verse 45, while small compared to the other verses in this chapter, they give us two critical principles for God's people to live by in the middle of stress times. First, even when all around is chaotic. God's people stand firm. That's exactly what happens in verse 32. In the middle, in the middle of this merciless ruler, verse 32 gives the vision of God's people being an anchor in the storm. And second, no matter how bad circumstances get, God's people trust that God's appointed end will come. As bad as Antiochus was, as much persecution as he brought, verse 45 says, yet he shall come to an end with none to help him. Just two small verses in a sea of turmoil is the picture of what it looks like for many times for God's people. This is a, a wonderful example for the church of God today. Will we trust God in the chaos 
and stand firm in our faith. And no matter how bad circumstances become, will we believe that God's appointed end will come just as he has planned? And we are not living under the oppression of a evil ruler like Antiochus Epiphanes, but we are living in strange times. I mean, certainly the quarantine of, because of the coronavirus is on all of our minds first. And the question becomes, will we trust God? Will we stand firm in our faith even when we have no idea what the future looks like? But even beyond the coronavirus, if we even look outside of that bubble, this text serves as a model for the church of Christ. As we live in a culture that is becoming more and more hostile to Christianity, increasingly you will feel the pressure of others when they ask questions like, do you really believe that? I mean, that seems so old-fashioned. That seems so outdated. It seems, seems so narrow-minded for you to say that, for you to believe that. I mean, come on, do you, you really believe that? And increasingly, you will feel the pressure to blend in, pressure to twist the interpretation of Scripture, pressure to soften the meaning of Scripture to fit the cultural expectation in this increasingly hostile time to the faith, we must ask ourselves, will we be the people of God in verse 32, standing firm, taking action when everything else around us is chaotic? And even when circumstances grow worse, even if the unimaginable happens, Will we trust that God's appointed end will come just as he has planned? I'll remind you how these two chapters fit together. Chapter 10, chapter 11 that we've done a a flyover of. Let me remind you how they fit together. Church, you will not stand firm in the midst of a chaotic world. And you will not trust in God's appointed end as circumstances become worse unless you have the perspective of God that chapter 10 gives us. You will not stand firm in perseverance when times are chaotic. You will not trust God's appointed end unless you have the high view of God that Daniel had in chapter 10. If your view of God is not high, one that is reverent, one that trusts in his supreme sovereignty overall, that believes the Bible over your logic, if you do not have that view of God, when times of chaos come, when the ground shifts beneath your feet, you will not stand firm. You will cling to whatever security you can find outside of God. If you don't have an unshakable knowledge of God's covenant love to you as one of his elect children, you will lose heart and doubt his care for you in the midst of your most violent storms. If you do not have an unwavering confidence in the unseen work of God, you will sink beneath the weight of fear anxiety, concern for the future. And when the waves start coming into your boat and all you can see is what's happening around you, if you don't have a confidence in the unseen work of God, you will sink. Church, the way that we stand firm is by trusting in the high sovereign God The way we believe hardships are for our good is remembering that God loves us. The way we trust that ultimately God will have the final word is by remembering that his work is in a realm unseen to our human eyes. So if you're a a child of God today, I would ask you this. What has you tired and worn out? 
What has you feeling unstable at the moment? What has you feeling that you can't see where God is working? What has you worried, concerned? What circumstances in your life today has you defeated? Has you ready to quit at your wit's end? Where do you sense your fears and anxieties rising? Child of God, have you forgotten that God is sovereign over the chaos? Child of God, have you forgotten that God loves you? Jesus said, look at the birds of the air. He said, look at the flowers in the field. If God takes care of them, will he not take care of you? whom he loves more than these? Have you forgotten that God is working in an unseen realm that could explain all the circumstances that you see around you? There is a kingdom that we cannot see. It's one that's all around us But the only thing we can see is what our eyes have right in front of us. Will you believe that what you see is not all that there is? And while we share in this quarantine time, we all have other circumstances that feel chaotic to us. And I don't know what each of yours are. But here's a final word of encouragement to you this morning in whatever circumstances you find yourself in, whatever chaotic situation where the ground feels trembling. My final word of encouragement to you comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16 through 18, where it says this. We do not lose heart. Though our outer selves is wasting away, Our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. I don't know about you But I'm so ready to see the unseen world. Let's pray. Oh God, you are high and lifted up. And oh God, how desperately we need you to elevate our perspective of you. God, we we fear and we become anxious and worried and concerned because we lose our sight on you. Just like Peter standing on the water and he begins to sink when he takes his eyes off you, Lord. We succumb to fear and anxiety when we take our eyes off of you, Lord. When we look at all the fearful circumstances around us instead of looking at the rock solid, in control, sovereign God that you are. So Lord, my prayer is that in this time, Certainly when we all are feeling the effects of this coronavirus, but God, this this has so many rippling effects of chaos that brings to people's lives. I pray that you will remind us of your sovereignty, that you will remind us of your love for us, that you will remind us of your unseen work that's taking place. And as we have those things in our mind, oh God, help us to stand firm and trust that you are bringing about your appointed end in your perfect timing. Strengthen the church of God today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
Bring go. 